الكريم والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد علم ما في علم الله صلاة الله وحمده على ملك الله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل وقفة من لساني يبقى القول So yesterday we were uh, we began the fifth uh, juz, the khulasa of the fifth juz of the Quran, and we covered the first few points in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains to us the conditions about marrying more than once, and then we mentioned the permissible gains the one is allowed uh, in tijara and investment, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the evil of hasad, of envy how hasad destroys one's good deeds, just the way fire destroys crops. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in verse 34 that a man is responsible for the family's upkeep, that men are the guardians and supporters of women because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given some of them virtue over others and also because the men spend their wealth on them, i.e. the husband pays the mahar and is responsible for his wife and children's upkeep. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about reconciling between husband and wife that if a dispute between husband and wife cannot be resolved between themselves then the Quran has taught us a method of reconciliation that one person from the husband's family or one person from the wife's family they should sit down and they should reconcile and try and, do, try and make islah between uh, the husband and the wife. But this word is very important, very very important. I have lost count how many times I have been approached by brothers in the masjid to reconcile between them and their wife over issues that they're having and um, unfortunately a lot of the time when brothers get married they don't look at the family they're married into right and it's the same thing with the sisters as well they don't look into the family that they're married into the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree generally a person will be like the way their family is if the family is deen inclined then the person will be deen inclined and if the person is deen inclined then alhamdulillah you have a middle ground that you can reconcile on. But if people are caught up in their ways, in their culture, in their own family tradition, and it's their way or highway, you get married to that person, what is good is great. The moment you have problems, you remember one thing. If you go to her mother, or if you go to her, her father or her brothers, if they're not reasonable people, they're going to side with her. And the same for the sisters. If she goes to the mother of, the, uh, of, of her husband or the father or the sisters, and no matter what wrong her husband is doing, they're going to side with their son or their brother. So, one of the ways of making sure that you have people that have common sense to reconcile between the husband and wife is that you look at the family. And that's very, very important. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to us about the neighbors. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us three types of neighbors. He says neighbors who are also relatives and this relationship could be family ties or Islamic ties. A neighbor is uh, a neighbor who is a stranger, i.e. neither a relative nor the, from the same religion. And a neighbor whose proximity arises from the work or study, this person is also a neighbor. Remember, according to Imam Azam Abu Hanifa, a neighbor, anyone who is 40 houses to your right and 40 houses to your left, 4-0, that's a neighbor. And their haq upon you is that they eat what you eat. That you fulfill their rights. If they are in trouble, problem, financial problem, then you're there to serve them. Allah. Remember that. That's the strictest opinion of the Ahnaf. So often we live on a road. We've been living on a road for many, many years. We don't know our neighbors. We don't even know the people who live opposite us. Right? Okay? Most of us, we don't have any non-Muslims in our neighborhoods, in our roads. But I remember when we moved in, my father, in 1989, we moved into New Ridge Road. We were probably the second or the third Muslim Pakistani family in the whole world. The whole world was full of white people and non-Muslims. And my father made a habit that whenever I would be on the road, he would tell me to say hello to my next door neighbor. Right? He would tell me to say hello to the woman across the road. And like this, there was familiarity. And remember, just because they don't have the same faith of you as you, doesn't mean that you don't help them as much as you can. Remember, non-Muslims don't know Quran. They don't know Hadith. They know you. They see you. The best way for you to give da'wah about Islam is to show Islam through your kibdar, through your character. Allah. That is the way that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa gave da'wah. And then Allah tells us not to be miserly or to show off. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 41 speaks that on the day of the judgment, all the prophets will testify to the condition and deeds of their respective, um, respective ummahs. Whilst our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa will testify 
that the testimony of all the Anbiya is true. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a hukum in verse 43. La taqrabu salah wa antum suqam. Don't go near prayer whilst in a state of intoxication. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the rules of tayyamum following this verse. Then Allah gives us the method of tayyamum. Remember, tayyamum is that practical way of making wudu when water isn't available. Right? When water isn't available. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 46 mentions a vile habit of the Ahlul Kitab, the people of the book, that they would change the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one way of doing this was by moving a word from its rightful place or by hiding it. And while they were told of Allah's command, instead of saying we heard and obeyed, they would say we heard and we and not obeyed and we will not hear your command. They would change the, the Torah and the Injil to suit their own, uh, to suit their, own uh, their purpose. Whatever their purpose was, whatever the means, whatever they were trying to, their own objectives, they would change the word of Allah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in verse 48 that he will forgive every sin, every sin except one. Which is shirk. Holding partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the one sin Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not give. What does this mean? It means that, now this isn't encouraged by the way. As someone who's a habitual drunkard, he drinks alcohol. Okay? But he does some good deeds as well. It's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah can forgive him. Allah can take him to account for his drinking habit, his drug habit. But say that a person was committing shirk. Right? Okay? A person was committing shirk, even if it is unknowingly, even if it is unknowingly, he will get punished for it. Shirk is that one sin that not only do you have to make tawbah, but remember you have to stop doing it completely. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that um, uh, about the verse 51, that Ahlul Kitab, um, they believe in idols and the devil and speaks about how low they would sink. And in order to wait who with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the chiefs of the Yahud, Ka'ab bin Ashraf, and, uh, and Huyay bin Akhtab uh, <coughs> went to make alliances with the Mushrikeen of Mecca and the Mushrikeen said that they would not trust the chiefs until they prostrated made sujood to the Mushrikeen idols which these two did which was ironic because they're monotheists they believed in the one God but because you know, the old saying my enemy's enemy is my friend because they wanted to destroy the message of Islam and the conditions that the Mushrikeen of Mecca gave to him is okay we're not going to trust you unless you make so due to our idols, they even forgot their own deen and they made so to the idols just because of their hatred of the Prophet wasallam. And this is a, in reality, it's a question that you ask, how low can you sink? How low can you sink? Okay, you don't believe in our faith, but you believe that there's only one God. But just to destroy another monotheistic faith, you made so to the idols. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in verse 58, the orders of Muslims not to breach trusts to their rightful owners. Remember, amana, my brothers, is a big thing. It's a big thing and it's a lost concept. Your word is an amana. When you give something to someone, that's an amana, right? Often we neglect this. Someone tells us something, they tell us not to tell anyone. What do we do? Straight away when we tell someone, we say, don't tell them that I told you, right? Okay, common, common breakage of amana that someone gives us. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in verse 59, all believers, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those in power. And this is an unconditional obedience a Muslim must show towards Allah and His Prophet and the conditional obedience shown towards the people in authority. Unconditional towards Allah and His Rasul, but conditional towards people in authority. What does this mean? It means that for as long as you can, you don't create fitna against the rulers. But if the rulers go against the Quran and the Sunnah, then you have to speak up against them. Then you have to speak up against them. And you have to demonstrate peacefully, not to create facade and fitna, but you have to use your voice against them. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the Prophet in verse 60 to 63, and he mentions that the evil way and the double standards of the munafiqeen, that there is an, uh, and then there is an iman refreshing glad tidings for the believers, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, and we sent every messenger only so that they may be obeyed and Allah's and with Allah's permission uh, that when they uh, when people end up oppressing themselves O oh messenger they come to you and seek forgiveness for and you seek forgiveness for their sins and Allah and his messenger also seeks forgiveness for their sins and then they will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most forgiving the most merciful when you do zulm upon yourself when you go to the Prophet you ask him to make 
make, make dua for your forgiveness. <coughs> and when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa makes dua for your forgiveness, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives you. And indeed, Allah loves those who forgive them. <coughs> Remember, this hukum was not only for when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was alive. It was not on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Even now, when we go to Masjid al Nawi, Medina al Numa Nawra, what do we do after we give salam to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and then the Khulafa? What do we do? We ask Rasulullah first and first of all, we say, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah, wa ashadu annaka Sayyidina Muhammad al Abdul wa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then we make dua, Ya Rasulullah, we've come with our sins, with our broken state, and we beg you, and we're your guests in your city, and we ask you to make dua on our behalf, that your Rabb forgives us. And before we leave this city, he sends us clean with no sins. This is what we do, and each and every one of us does this, even 1400 years later, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the importance of obeying the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Remember, obeying Allah's messenger is in reality doing itaat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's impossible to obey Allah and not to obey the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We only know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Without the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what would that concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be? The Arabs in Makkah and Medina would still be worshipping idols. We would have been Hindus, you know, or Sikhs. But because of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we were given the nur of Tawheed. We were given Islam. Therefore, true obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only achieved through truly obeying the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us guidelines of jihad which are quite extensive. Then Allah again reminds us that death will find you wherever you are. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the signs of the mushrikeen and tells us that the mushrikeen are those who say one thing to you, but behind, when with the kuffar and the mushrikeen and the deniers, the hypocrites, they say, no, 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 we were jesting with them, reality were with you. And we should remember, a hypocrite is someone whose reality you don't know. Whose reality you don't know. But you know, subhanAllah, the sign of someone not being a munafiq in a hadith, in a sahih hadith, he who prays is Fajr and Aisha in Jama'ah for 40 days. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, I give guarantees not a munafiq. Allah lifts nifaq out of your heart. That's one of the ways. And subhanAllah, you know, um, one of the one of the companions, Sayyidina Hudayfa ibn al-Imam, Rabbi Allah ta'ala anhu, right, Sahib al-Sil, he was known as the, 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 the companion of the secrets, because whilst all the other companions used to ask the Prophet sallallahu about good, he used to ask the Prophet sallallahu about evil, about fitna. And he was someone who would always ask about who the hypocrites are, who the hypocrites are, and the Prophet sallallahu used to tell him. And look at this, Umar ibn al-Khattab, Rabbi Allah anhu. Look at the man. After me, Prophet said this, that there would ever be a Nabi, it would be Umar radiallahu anhu. Hadith, Sahih Hadith. Yet, Sayyidina Umar, when he was a middle mu'mineen, he would go to Sayyidina Hudayfa and he would say, I want you to tell me, am I a munafiq? Am I a hypocrite? Am I one of those that the Prophet mentioned? Look at the fear that they had of hypocrisy. Something that we have lost today. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us not to spread rumors and the evil of rumors. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us some social etiquettes that if someone gives you salam, reply to them in a better way. If someone says assalamu alaikum, you say wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. And if someone says assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, you say wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuhu. Always try and better him in a better way. If someone gives you salam and they give you the full salam and they shake your hand, say the full salam back and smile at them, right? If someone just gives you some salam and smiles at you, Give them salam, smile at them and ask them how they are and actually mean it. Don't just say, how are you? Actually take two minutes and ask them, how's your family, how's your health? Show a liking to that person and an honor to that person. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the types of hypocrites that exist during the time of the war of the Muslims and had and how the Muslims had to encounter several different types of munafiq. And inshallah, this is something that we will cover tomorrow. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to understand the Quran Amen. and to uh, implement it and to make amal upon it.